Welcome to the Wednesday Match Play, your weekly connection to the biggest and best brands in golf. On this show, you will learn more about the latest golf fashion trends, hear from LPGA and PGA Tour players, get advice on planning your next golf getaway, and much more. Broadcasting live from Bonita Springs, Florida, please welcome your host, on the tee, Ricky Potts. Jeff and his wife Stacy are two of the most sought-after teaching professionals in the country. Together, they form the Fisher Bryan Golf Academy located at Longbow Golf Club, a trend managed facility in Mesa, Arizona. They have a passion for growing the game of golf, and Jeff has worked with fellow teaching professionals such as Hank Haney and Jim McLean, honing his craft. On this episode of the Wednesday Match Play Podcast, you will learn more about their academy and all they offer their students. You will also hear what other golf courses that Jeff likes to play and learn more about the packages they have created for their juniors and their adult students. Jeff is also good friends with Kevin Sprecher, a recent guest on this show. This conversation was a long time coming, and I am honored to have Jeff featured on this podcast. Jeff, welcome to the Wednesday Match Play Podcast. Thanks for having me, Ricky. Really excited to have you on the show. I've been following the Academy for good number of years. And now that Troon is involved with the property, I'm no longer in Arizona, but you're at a fantastic facility there in Mesa. So let's just start by giving us an overview of the Academy, where you're located, what golfers can expect from the Academy, and just kind of the elevator pitch of what the Fisher Bryan Golf Academy is all about. Sure. We are in our 10th season at Longwood Golf Club in Mesa and have been there for the whole duration of the Academy. We kind of started out as our flagship was elite juniors, but our programs have kind of expanded so that we teach everybody from tour player to elite college players and junior players and beginners and every level of, of recreational golfer. And it's, you know, it's a family business. My wife, Stacy and I are the lead instructors and we just have a fun time doing, doing what we do every day, getting to go to the golf course, getting to teach at a great facility like Longbow and help people with their golf games. Well, you answered my next question, but tell me more about Stacy Bryan. Uh, Stacy was actually my coach when I was playing for a living decades ago, and she helped me kind of get on that path. And then she, you know, she came right out of college and taught for Mike and Sandy LeBove and has had her own programs at Sunridge Canyon and places on the East Coast and was actually at Longbow herself when I came back from Hilton Head, where I was the lead instructor at the Hank Haney International Junior Golf Academy. And she is just, you know, one of the most sought after female instructors in Arizona. And I trusted my game to her when I was playing for a living. And I don't think anybody could go wrong having her as their coach. Well, that's really cool. And in your past, you've worked with some pretty big names. Hank Haney, Jim McLean, a recent guest of the show, Kevin Sprecher, had had some experience working with Jim. Do you stay in touch with these guys? And what are some of the most important things they taught you over the years? Uh, I do. You know, I have made some great friendships through the years of being a teacher all across the country. I consider, you know, Hank, my greatest mentor. He Hank is the hardest working instructor I've, I've ever seen. He works harder for his students than anybody I've ever seen. He's hands on. He gets in there. He, you know, he digs in and he's just not going to let you go until you're getting better. And from him, I learned not only that and that work ethic and make sure I'm working as hard as the student is, if not harder, but also he is one of the best diagnosticians I've ever seen. And he taught me how to be able to take a swing apart, see where the big miss was coming and get in there and fix it, fix it as soon as possible. And I think not a lot of instructors are as hands-on as, as Hank is, as I am. And being hands-on and getting in and moving people around and just being passionate about helping your student get better on an everyday basis, I couldn't have asked for a better mentor than Hank. And, you know, he was a, not an easy guy to work for all the time. But afterwards, I look back, I was like, man, I couldn't have been who I am now without having gone through the periods in my career of working for Hank. Hank has become an online friend of mine, and I've not even had the chance to spend much time with him offline, but I enjoy his content. I enjoy his banter on social media and his videos that he's produced and the books that he's written. The guy just gets it, and it's good to hear the validation from someone that's worked with him that that's the case because the time that he's- He, he does. 
even since. What he did with Tiger was obviously important to his career and to Tiger's. But to know that he's still out there teaching, he's still got a mission and a finger on the footprint of growing the game of golf is, is exciting to hear. He does. He just, he like, he loves helping people get better. And, you know, he it always makes it off. He doesn't say, hey, who's coaching this person? He says, hey, who's helping this guy? You're just always helping a student and you're always helping them to get better. And you're right there. And Hank just loves teaching the game of golf. And that's kind of what he instilled in me. And I, I love going to work every day. I love having a different student in front of me every hour or a different group of kids in front of me every afternoon. I just know I couldn't have been where I am now if he didn't push me to get better every day myself. So you mentioned tour players. I know you've worked with LPGA, PGA, web.com players. Are you teaching sure. any tour players currently? I am. I'm, I actually, when she first came out of, or actually when she first got into college, I was helping me a hair guy. And you know, we got her through semester tour and got her LPGA tour card. And, you know, she had a great start to her career. You know, we, she went a different direction for a couple of years. And she and I got back together about a year and a half ago. And we're working hard with her. She had a really good year last year, got into some feature pairings in the British Open and uh, things like that. And I'm actually waiting for the telecast latest evening to come on from the Australian Open. They're 18 hours ahead. So she's over in Australia getting her LPGA season started right now. There are a lot of good golf courses in Scottsdale, Phoenix area. Longbow is one of them. You've got True North. You've got Kierlin. You've got Whirlwind. I mean, Whirlwind is two unbelievable golf courses. Besides Longbow, where do you like to play? You know, I like to – I a lot of times I spend with – out of different golf courses are going around and playing different um, practice rounds with our kids who are getting in tournaments. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been at Wigwam, and we've been at – uh, Raven, and we're getting set in the next couple weeks here to go to Wickenburg Ranch, which is another tune facility. There's just so many good golf courses. It's almost hard to pick one, but I always, always have a soft spot in my heart for Dever Desert Mountain. You, it's hard to beat being up there. You get to pick from six different golf courses. I was able to work there for Mr. Flick. Any c different style course that you want, any length course, any challenge you want, you can find it up on the mountain. So that would probably be my favorite. Tell me more about Future Champions and all of the recognition that you have received from that organization. Future Champions is an organization out of San Diego started by a good friend of mine, Chris Schmiel, and it's geared towards elite junior golfers and an elite junior golfers tour. And a few years ago, Chris and I realized that there was a lot of recognition being paid to kid, coaches who teach younger kids and get them started in the game with the U.S. Kids Golf Top 50 and things like that. And so we thought the coaches who were really excelling at taking kids and turning them into college golfers and helping them get college golf scholarships and things like that were coaches that needed recognition. So we came up, uh, we initiated what's called the Top 25 Elite Junior Coaches in the Country. And we made it a blind you know, committee that, of tour players and coaches and things like that who picked the original top 25 so that we didn't have anything to do with it. And you know, I was lucky enough to be that first year named one of the top 25 elite junior coaches in the country and got that three years in a row. And I've now moved on to what they call elite master coach. And it's just a really select group of people who specialize in getting kids to college. And I think that's, you know, a great calling for some of these coaches because it's great to make people better golfers and help them have more fun. But when you're able to help kids pay for college, that's a life changing event. And so that's what that future champions top 25 elite coaches is about is recognizing those guys who excel in that arena. Let's say someone listening is interested in, in learning how to play golf. Where do you recommend that he or she starts? Do you think they should just go buy clubs and hit the range, book a tee time, take some lessons? Where do you think they should begin? I think, you know, the first thing would be just to go out to the golf course. And I wouldn't suggest that somebody go and invest in a bunch of golf clubs before they start. They, it's always helpful. I think there's a lot of great programs like Get Golf Ready and things like that that can help you introduce you to just being at the golf course and learning all the things that need to go into making a tee time. I think one of the things that people, the misstep that they make is not finding a facility that's commensurate with 
the fact that they're starting, you know, finding some of these great par three golf courses or executive golf courses or shorter nine hole things that are conducive to playing quicker and learning the game and not having a bunch of pressure and not having high green fees. I think people end up getting into the game and getting out quickly because they go to a championship style golf course, pay a lot of money, feel like they're rushed, feel like they're overwhelmed and kind of in over their head and then go, Hey, this isn't for me. I think if they find a facility that is beginner friendly, being at a par three or a rec- uh, an executive golf course where they can rent clubs and kind of ease themselves into the game, I think that's the best place to start. And, you know, finding one of those good get golf ready programs is always, you know, beneficial for a beginner. Juniors, as you know, are the future of golf. Tell me more about what you're doing to help grow the game, specifically the tournament players program. And the Troom Junior Club is also an initiative that I'm sure you're familiar with. Tell me a little bit more about all that you're doing to help grow the game. Yeah, juniors is kind of, you know, where we, like I said, where we started our flagship and our tournament players program is that program that takes competitive players and helps take them to the next level and get them hopefully to, to college golf. And we've had some great success with that over the last 12 years. We sent more than 150 kids to play college golf at all different levels from, you know, junior college and NIA to division one coached an NCAA national women's uh, player of the year and a national junior college men's player of the year, you know, a bunch of all Americans and conference champions and things like that. And like I said before, that's getting kids to that level is a life changing event for them. It, pays for college and it sets them up for, you know, a career and things like that. And backing that up, we have programs that start kids at six years old and go all the way and can take them from a beginner all the way to what we call a blue chip recruitable athlete. And we just really put a lot of focus in growing junior golf. I was in 2015, I was a Southwest section um, youth player development coach of the year award winner. And we coach, Anyway, every month from 60 to 75 kids a week through our various age group and, and elite programs. And luckily, Longo Golf Club and our owner, Bob McNichols, really puts a big premium on helping those programs. So Longo is very junior friendly. All of our programs come with practice and play privileges, not only for the juniors that are in the program, but their families as well. So it's just a w- really welcoming environment. And we do our best to grow that program as well. Uh, I'm involved with the JGA and their junior master series event. In fact, our academy is sponsoring their event this weekend. So junior golf is a huge initiative for us. It should be a huge initiative for anybody who wants to grow the game and keep their program afloat and their course going. And there's just not enough that we can possibly do for junior golf. There are a lot of good golf movies. I like 10 cup, happy Gilmore. What is your favorite golf movie? It's hard to beat Tin Cup just because it's so it's almost so ludicrous. You know, the the rags to riches deal and and my favorite scene is him in there in the R V with all his different gadgets on because I look down the range all the time and I see all these people trying these different gadgets, the guy with his belt uh wrapped around his arm and things like that. And it's just it shows the constant pursuit of always trying to get better when it's so and and the lengths that people will go to get better at the game so I think from showing what tour players do all these other things it's it's almost impossible to beat uh, Tinka. I've used TrackMan, Sam Putlab, a variety of other technologies. What different technologies are you using and have you seen a lot of success with those with your students? We do use, I would say that we don't necessarily use as much of the technology as, as some places do. You know, we have a green grass facility. It's 110 degrees in the summer in Arizona. So we use the stuff that we feel is necessary. We use blast motion. We use coach now video um, systems. We've used V1 and JC in the past. We, you know, use our flight scope quite a bit. I think those are all good tools for, you know, diagnosis of swings i think the big key for coaching is can you take that diagnosis and impart the knowledge that you've gained to the student the 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 good thing now is there's so many things coming out that aren't that 
25, $30,000 price point that students can practice with on their own. Blast motion is a great one. Mirror vision golf has just come out. I think for us, things that will help students practice that they can use on their own are, are the best things possible. And like I said, we're going to use everything that we have available to us to help our students get better, but things that they can use on an everyday basis, like blast, like mirror vision, like, you know, coach now or huddle just to videotape their swings are the things that are the staples of our program. Thoughts on the new Callaway golf Epic flash driver. Epic flash driver is just something that is a, is a game changer in, in the industry. The way it was made with the artificial intelligence and, and con- computer generated face, you know, one of the things that every competitor does when somebody else makes a new driver is go buy it, tear it apart and look at how they did it. And I'm not entirely sure that when a competitor of Callaway cuts apart a flash driver and looks at the face that they're going to be able to figure out how this thing was designed. It's just otherworldly different, even from the Epic and the Rogue, which were you know, great products to begin with. The Flash is just so much faster and so much more consistent that it's, it's just next level golf. Callaway always seems to impress when they release a new club. Let's say, and this they, is, I'm sorry, we can cut that out. Uh, no, go, ahead. Right, go ahead. I thought you were stopping. You're, you're, no, okay. you're good. I, I thought you were going to stop. You're right. Go ahead. This is actually happening to me. Let's say that I'm hitting the ball right off the tee, and I'm talking tiger right, like really okay. far right. Driver okay. is the only club in the bag that I'm struggling with. Without seeing the swing, without seeing the miss, how would you diagnose that, and what would you recommend as a temporary fix to hitting more fairways? Well, I know you and I have talked about this a little bit on social media. And that the deal for me is the ball, you know, the path, the, where the ball goes and how it's curving will always give you a really good sense of what the path is and what the, you know, what the face is doing. And when a ball is going really hard to the right without a bunch of curve on it, it's just a big block that says to me, Hey, someone's is face is really, or I mean, path is really inside to out. And so I would try to neutralize that path, try to get that path more down the target line. So you have an easier time squaring that club face. At the same time, you know, real world, pro- real world problem is, hey, I got to get this ball on the fairway, and do I have to back off short term to my three wood on game day to get this ball on the fairway so that I can hit more greens and shoot a lower score? So I think coming off to a fairway wood is, is a definite option when we got to get in the fairway. And like you said, the only club that you have in your bag that you're having trouble with is the driver. But as far as fixing that driver, issue we got to get that path less from inside out and more down the line and feeling you mentioned tiger feeling that swing more over to the left and if you remember when he had that big right miss he was trying to feel an exaggerated swing over to the left and i'm a big proponent of exaggeration swings to train a miss so if that initial swing is under we got to make a swing that's over to try and uh, and help that big miss right the USGA introduced a lot of changes to the rules of golf this year, from how you drop the ball to the OB rules to leaving the pin in while putting, which I actually like to do. And I'm not sure it helps. I think it just makes me play a little faster. But on all of the changes, what are some of your favorites? What do you think won't stick? And do you think that they'll help with pace of play? I think the overriding theory of all the rules changes were to – help with speed of play i think at this point right now they probably won't just because they're new and they're a little bit confusing and things like that um but i think over the span of time they probably will i think the rules of golf have gotten too big you know they're they're fairly complicated and and we saw last or two weeks ago at waste management you know ricky fowler get a penalty for a ball that he hadn't even you know touched it just went on in water on its own after you know the ball should have been at rest i think they have to be a little bit more open to interpretation the one that i think will probably go away the quickest is the thing about caddies not lining up players because i think it's 
not definitive enough about what is a caddy lining up a player and what isn't. We've already seen penalties rescinded. And I think that's just, that's a bad look for, for the USGA. And I think that they need to, you know, put some clarity on some things and rather than just use the rules to make the speed of play faster, I think their goal should be to simplify and clarify the rules. My favorite is I really like the um, dropping the ball from the knee. I think it will cause fewer redrops. I think it'll make the ball stay a little bit easier and you can get the ball, you know, to drop where you want it to drop. Besides private instruction, what other things does Fisher Bryan Golf Academy offer? Do you have group instruction? Do you sell packages? Kind of give us an overview of what folks at home can purchase from Fisher Bryan Golf Academy. We do um, a little bit of everything so that the student can pick, you know, the best way for, for them to learn. Our, our biggest programs are group programs. You know, we do juniors and groups. We do our elite players in a mix of group and private and I think part of the allure of a group is that you don't have a student I mean a coach standing over you the whole time you're you know you can take a little bit of break or you can make a mistake without feeling like the coach is just standing right there there's a social aspect so we do do private we do do um, packages but our packages are all time-based to encourage the student to come on a regular basis rather than, hey, buy 10 lessons and come whenever you want. Ours are a month or two months or three months. And so we encourage students to stay on track. All of our junior programs are monthly programs where they come three times a month for their group class and they come three times a month for open supervised practice. So, and because we do those monthly group packages, we're able to include the practice and play privileges. So everything we're trying to do is to get the golfer to the golf course more often on a regular basis. And I think groups do that from a social aspect. Hey, I want to go see these kids or these people that I play or practice with every week. And the time frame gets them coming back. They make an appointment to come. They know, hey, I've got to go three times this month. Uh, I don't want to lose that. So let me make my appointments and actually stick to it. Whereas something like the gym, you join and no one's monitoring if you're going or not. This is really, we feel, the most effective way of getting people better in a shorter frame of time. And it's also more cost effective for the student as well. Where can folks at home learn more about the academy? You can always go uh, fisherbryangolf.com is the easiest way. It's got all of our information. You can fire, follow uh, us at Fisher Bryan Golf on Instagram and Facebook. You can always you know, get my phone number and give me a call directly. Sounds pretty easy to find you. I'm Tiger's biggest fan, so be careful how you answer this. But do you think he breaks Jack's record? Why or why not? I don't think he's going to break Jack's record just because I think the number of guys that can step up and win a major on you know, a, week, a, a yearly basis is a greater number. And I think it's not like you know, he's got to go out there and beat five guys. I think there's probably in every major, there's probably 20 or 30 guys that are capable of winning that week. And I think that number is a little too big for him to get five more out of it. Okay. I don't like the answer, but I'm going to allow it because you had a legitimate answer. Okay, good. You do a lot of work with video production, share a lot of great content on Instagram and social media. What is the motivation behind video production? Are you seeing a trend with video or do you find that your students engage with that content more than photos, text? Well, I think the world is changing. I mean, I think it's, you know, social media is a big part of just doing business in general. I think golf instruction is moving largely in that way. I mean, I always want to be able to see a student face to face, but and, you know, get hands on with them and really diagnose, I think. But I think everything is we're a instant gratification type society. And if someone can get a 30 second clip and that entices them to go try what we showed or, you know, give us a call. But I will say that I get a lot of people, you know, just I'm walking around in the golf world at different golf courses or I have students come and say, hey, we're here because, you know, we saw the stuff that you're doing on Instagram or we saw something on the Longbow website, a video that you did. And I think that's just 
one, it's a part of doing business in any business is, is engaging with your customers. I think we're seeing some guys in the golf industry have huge success. Guys and girls in the golf industry have huge success through social media. And, you know, if there's another way for us to engage with clients and grow the game, it's 30 seconds with my iPhone or 60 seconds with my iPhone on the tee between lessons. It's something that I enjoy doing and I like to share the content. And if I can help a handful of people a day that I might not otherwise see, then, you know, that's a bonus for me. What's next for Fisher Bryan Golf Academy? I think we're, you know, we're always looking to grow. Our goal is to, you know, help as many people as possible. And hopefully that means more instructors and more facilities and bigger programs. And, you know, like I said, we're doing, you know, between 60 and 75 junior golfers a week. Our goal is to, you know, double that in a year, you know, have more and more kids going to college and have more kids getting into the game. And as golf grows, and, and it is growing, people want to say it's not, but as golf continues to grow, Fisher Bryan Golf Academy is going to continue to grow with it and hopefully, you know, kind of lead the way in that. Based on what I've seen, the future is definitely bright for you and your wife and the academy. In golf, the 19th hole is a slang term for a bar or a restaurant on or near the golf course, very often in the clubhouse itself. There are a lot of great places to have a drink in Mesa. What is your favorite 19th hole and what are you drinking? I think, you know, the 19th hole, quite honestly, at Longwood Golf Club, is hard, hard to beat. Our owner has put a lot of time and effort into creating an atmosphere on our patio that overlooks the 18th green. Anything local that is, that is on tap, um, Santan breweries and things like that are, are always good it's on a nice, hot, refreshing day in Arizona. So something cold and local on tap overlooking the 18th green at Longo would always be my choice. I've seen that view and I've had beers with that view. So I, I think that might be the best place to have a cocktail in Mesa. So now I want a beer from Santan. Look what you've done. There you go. Jeff, I've been following the Academy for several years, and I love the golf course and the place that you've created there in Arizona. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. It's been a long time coming. I've been bugging you about it for quite some time now, so glad we were able to finally make this happen, and I look very much forward to where the Fisher Bryan Golf Academy goes from here. That puts this installment of the Wednesday Match Play in the books, but we'll be back next week for another exciting episode of the show. As always, remember to eat sleep, golf.